Good afternoon and welcome to Midday Moms. This is Dorothy Polarski speaking. I'm uh, thrilled that you're here. And as you're signing on, uh, we would love very much if you could say hello to us in the chat box. Um, I'm just very delighted, always delighted when uh, we have Dr. Josephine Lombardi uh, join us. Um, as many of you uh, may know, she is on our Mother's Ministry Advisory Committee and has been a tremendous um, support, a tremendous help, <laughs> a tremendous advocate. Uh, we're just very, very blessed to have uh, Dr. Josephine Lombardi as a part of our Mother's Ministry Advisory Committee, and we're blessed to have her here. Um, hello, Claude. Claude tunes in all the way from Dubai. And we keep on hoping that uh, Claude is going to start a mother's group in uh, Dubai at St. Mary's there. Um, hello to Catherine Lewis. Great to see you. Um, and so for the rest of you that are sitting there in the background, we want you to say hello. <laughs> we're, we're very much encouraged when uh, moms say hello to us. We love hearing from our mother's group leaders. We love hearing from all the moms that are joining us. If you have any questions and so on, please you know, post them in the chat box. Um, we're delighted that you're here and we're thrilled that you've made the time to join us today. Um, Dr. Lombardi is joining us to um, just share a little bit of information about the Memorial of the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, but before she does that, we'd like to talk a little bit about our ministry. Um, we encourage all of you to visit our website at catholicmomsgroup.com. I always say it's really easy to remember. It's three words, catholicmomsgroup.com. <laughs> Visit our website. I'm going to share our uh, ministry video with you so you'll know a little bit about it, us. Oh, uh, Vitina, hello. Hello, Vitina from St. Justin Martyr Parish in Markham. Hello, hello. I believe our mother's group leader there is uh, Rita Perta and another mom, her name escapes me at the moment. Thank you for joining us. So I'm gonna share our ministry video. And if uh, you could be uh, a little bit patient with me, I would appreciate it. Before I share the video, I'm going to just formally introduce Dr. Josephine Lombardi. Dr. Josephine Lombardi is an award-winning author and documentary filmmaker who has worked as a parish minister, a university campus minister. Uh, she was the professor of religious education at Brock University. Um, she was program coordinator at the Diocese of Hamilton. Right now, she's the Associate Professor of Pastoral and Systemic Theology at St. Augustine Seminary in Scarborough. Um, she's got a remarkable uh, new film, The uh, First Lady and Her Successors. She's a prolific gifted writer, and I would encourage all of you to read um, many of her books, but especially an all-time favorite of mine is Experts in Humanity. Um, but just, you know, moving forward to our ministry video, our ministry helps parishes start three types of Catholic moms groups. We can help you start a group for mothers only, mothers and tots. And if you live in a remote area, we can help you start virtual mothers groups. Um, I'm always delighted to let people know that we have a mothers group in North Pole, Alaska. <laughs> um, so here's our ministry video. We're hoping that one of you here might be called uh, to start a Catholic moms group. Mothers, by our very nature, we are nurturing, loving caregivers. We are social beings made for friendship and community. We are also spiritual by nature, made by a loving God to know him and love him, and to pass this love of our Catholic faith on to our children. But right now, many mothers feel overextended 
distracted, and exhausted. Though as Catholics, we have the community of our church, many mothers attending mass could not name the mom sitting next to them in the pew they share. Community and support among Catholic mothers is desperately needed in this hectic and chaotic culture. Your parish needs you to bring these moms together. Hi, my name is Dorothy Polarski. I'm the founder of Catholic Moms Group. We at Catholic Moms Group are on a mission to revive the vocation of motherhood. We exist to bring together like-minded, faith-filled mothers who crave community and are focused on spiritual growth, Catholic teaching, and fellowship. Can you imagine a thriving, engaged mothers group at your parish? A group of moms in love with their Catholic faith, ready to serve other mothers no matter what stage of motherhood they're at. Can you imagine what a difference that would make at your parish? Starting a mother's group, it's not rocket science, but working with a team who's done it before and who's done it dozens and dozens of times sure does help. The Catholic Moms Group membership site is an online community that offers training, resources, and dozens of tools for parishes to help them start a mother's group quickly and efficiently. We're here to provide you with a clear path to launching a Catholic Moms Group at your parish. All of our materials are 100% Catholic. We have clearly laid out meetup plans for both moms groups and toddler groups. We are obedient to the magisterium of the Catholic Church. We have created dozens of tools that are going to save you time and energy. And besides that, we love our Blessed Mother. We constantly turn to her for her intercession. You can make a huge impact in your parish, so join us. We are revolutionizing the way parishes start mothers groups by providing parishes with a Catholic mothers group starter kit and by nourishing and training a community of Catholic mothers group leaders across the world. It's time to start a mothers group at your parish. Join us today. A big warm welcome to uh, Dr. Josephine Lombardi. A big warm welcome to all of you. I hope the Holy Spirit stirred something in one of you and one of you is saying, yes, I'm going to start a Catholic moms group. Um, again, Dr. Josephine Lombardi uh, is on our Mother's Ministry Advisory Committee. I always say that you know we wouldn't be her here without her help, without her support. So um, I wanted to extend a big, warm welcome to Dr. Josephine Lombardi. How are you, Dr. Oh, I'm Lombardi. well. Yeah. I'm well, Dorothy. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. I love watching that video. And congratulations to you and all the moms and everyone who's present here today and all the great work you're doing. Oh, no, thank you. And it, I always say there's so many people behind the scenes praying and helping. Um, and, and, and you're one of those people. So thank you. Um, I have to I have a little confession to make Josie is, uh, you know, every year, when the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the, you know, Memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Mary come up, I always interview someone about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And I thought, geez, you know, I really need to focus on the memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And I thought, gosh, you know, immediately you popped into my mind as someone who loves our Blessed Mother, is devoted to our Blessed Mother, and who supports hundreds, if not thousands of, of women in, in um, you know, taking our Blessed Mother on as mm -hmm. an icon, you know, through your books, through your movie, 
through your talks. And so um, I'm going to start crying here. <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a gift to have you here. And uh, it just feels so wonderful to shift the focus. I love the sacred heart of Jesus, <laughs> but to shift the focus to, um, you know, the immaculate heart of Mary. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the memorial of the immaculate heart of the blessed Virgin Mary and what that means? Okay. Well, thank you again. Mary is one of my favorite topics. So it's always a good to, <laughs> to share some thoughts about our beautiful blessed mother. Uh, well, the, the feast of the Memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Mary is rooted in sacred scripture. And so uh, we reflect on the various sorrows of our lady. So in, in particular, of course, the crucifixion, um, the prophecy of St. Simeon, her inner life, so the mystery of her inner life, including her suffering, inspired this devotion to her Immaculate Heart. And so we begin to see the devotion become more and more formal in the Middle Ages. Uh, so several saints like uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Bridget of Sweden, St. John Eudes, um, going back to the 17th century, uh, were really instrumental in encouraging a devotion to the heart of Mary and a reflection on her inner life. But it wasn't until 1969 that Pope Paul VI um, created this feast day, this memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, that it would follow the solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So although for centuries we have honored the Immaculate Heart of Mary, um, our understanding, our reflection has developed over the centuries. And so now we have this beautiful feast day. Um, and so when we depict the Immaculate Heart of Mary in sacred art, you'll, you'll, you'll see her with her heart exposed, uh, but with um, little, little thorns kind of going into her heart, like little swords. Uh, representing her seven seven sorrows, yes, the seven sorrows of Mary, um, and then a garland of roses around it. So when we think about the rosary, for example, in Latin, rosarium is a is a rose garden, and so we reflect on the beauty of her heart, and in doing that, we're honoring her inner life, who she was in her very being, but also her capacity to suffer because her capacity to suffer is very much bound up with her capacity to love. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there a difference then between the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows and the Feast of, are there, are they? Um, of well, our, the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, September the 15th, is where in particular we, we honor her sorrow. So I wrote them down just to make sure I don't forget. So on the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrow, September the 15th, um, we reflect on the prophecy of Simeon, of course, who told Our Lady that a sword would pierce her soul. And in the original Greek, the word Luke uses is romphea, which translates as a huge double-edged sword. So this is not a pocket knife or a butter knife, like Simeon is telling her, a big double-edged sword is going to pierce your soul, uh, signifying the size of the cross that she was going to carry in terms of being wounded. Um, so that's the prophecy of Simeon. Uh, another sorrow that we honor is the flight to Egypt. Uh, of course, the great pain she would have carried with the slaughter of the innocents, all the babes under the age of two. So that would have weighed heavily on her, but also worrying about her safety. Uh, Saint um, Anne Emmerich uh, out of Germany, a, a great mystic, uh, received private revelations regarding not only the life of our Lord, but the life of Our Lady. And it was revealed to her in a vision what Saint Joseph and Our Lady and baby Jesus went through on the flight to Egypt that they, they were always on the lookout for bandits. They were worried about being robbed, uh, beaten up, and left for dead on the side of the road. Um, and also the fear that Herod would find them. Uh, so I can't even imagine, like, when you think of the, the, the plight of refugees, uh, my own parents were not refugees, but they came from Italy, not speaking the language, not knowing where they were going, traveling on a boat, 
uh, to North America. So I can't imagine leaving your homeland, but also leaving with great terror that someone's going to find you and kill you. And so I'm sure they had to hide our Lord in some way. And maybe they traveled at night so no one could see them. And so the flight to Egypt, <clears throat> excuse me, is considered another sorrow. Um, the three days when our Lord goes missing and when our Blessed Mother finds him teaching in the temple at the age of 12. Uh, so here, anyone who's ever worried about a loved one, like the horror and the terror of waiting for a loved one to come home or to come out of surgery or, you know, that kind of anguish. Uh, and, and, and the words Our Lady uses, you know, we have been looking for you. We've been troubled with great anxiety. You know, she's feeling great anguish while she's looking for him. So that's the third. Um, watching her son carry the cross. Um, as a parent, you know, if you've had a child who's been unwell, or I know a dear mother whose little toddler is going through chemo treatment now uh, because he's been diagnosed with leukemia, and she's described the, the great pain of seeing his little body go through the, the treatment and, and just seeing him so weakened and lethargic. And, and Our Lady can relate to all of that, just witnessing her son go through the horror of the passion. Uh, so that's another sorrow. Uh, the crucifixion, of course, standing at the foot of the cross. So in, in the early days, as our uh, devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary was, was developing, we would we would ponder that mystery of Our Lady standing at the foot of the cross as is depicted in John's gospel. I um, mean, it's interesting, he has that detail. She was standing with all that sorrow and horror and trauma of witnessing what had happened to her son. Um, him being taken down from the cross is another sorrow and in holding his lifeless body. And then finally, um, the laying of his body in the tomb. So, so these are the, so the sorrows that we honor uh, with the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. But we also reflect on the sorrows when we honor the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so the Immaculate Heart of Mary, that particular feast day, is, is, is all-encompassing. So not only do we, we honor her capacity to suffer, but we honor her inner life and her capacity to love. Uh, so we reflect on all of that, her great yes to the angel Gabriel, uh, yes to God's plan for salvation history, um, and then I can say more about who she is in terms of the new Eve um, later if you'd like, because that there's a connection there as well, but I'll stop there to see if you have a question or a comment. Well, the, the, the one thing that kind of sort of jumped out at me right away is when you made the comment that we're asked or not that we asked, but that we consider reflecting on her um, interior life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a, something very important to focus on because in our culture right now, it appears to me anyway that, you know, you know, many moms, many women, many people are, you know, making changes in their life on an exterior basis, right? You know, getting a new job, getting a new car, uh, moving to a new city. And I'll never forget uh, the day I, I met, a, a, you know, a dear friend who said, you know, have you ever thought about the inner work that you have to do, Dorothy? I was like, the inner work, whoa. <laughs> uh, and um, and and, and our, our, our culture also, like we're so busy that very often we don't stop to do, you know, the inner work. Um, can you just say a little bit more about that and how moms, you know, despite the laundry and the running around and aging, you know, that, that we need to pause and do that inner work and that inner work never really ends, right? That, yeah, that, that's right, Dorothy. And so, so in order to even understand Our Lady's inner life, um, it's important that we start with what it means to be created in God's image, because uh, therein lies the insight into what it means to be authentically free, human, um, created in the image and likeness of God. So the, the catechism reminds us that to be created in God's image 
means, of course, that we are immortal and we have immortal souls, that the soul is the form of the body that is unchanging, everlasting, immortal. Um, but it also means that we're all equal in dignity, the dignity of the person um, also means that we were created with a capacity to grow in self-knowledge. So the inner life depends on us being self-aware and mm -hmm. possessing self-knowledge. So, so, so knowing myself, uh, there is um, St. Augustine uh, early on would teach, if you want to know God, you need to know yourself. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila, that, you know, you cannot grow in the inner life unless you know yourself. How can you pray if you don't know yourself? Um, the anonymous author of The Cloud of Unknowing, uh, labor and sweat to know yourself, and then you will know salvation, like healing and restoration. So the capacity for self-knowledge and self-awareness sets us apart from the animals, mm. God's other creatures, you know, so, so only we as humans are created in God's image. We have that capacity for self-knowledge, self-awareness. To be created in God's image also means we have the capacity for self-mastery, for self-aware and uh, self-regulation uh, rather self-control um to be self-possessed so that think about the cardinal virtue of temperance uh, or self-control it's also a fruit of the holy spirit and the holy spirit is the power of god's love so in receiving that love and in knowing ourselves i can work on this self-mastery you know so whether it's speech you know does my speech build people up and magnify God and my behavior, all my habits. Um, to be created in God's image also means that we have the capacity to reason, that we've been blessed with a conscience. And St. Paul refers to the conscience as the law written on our hearts, that with our ability to reason, I can come to understand certain truths by observing that which is seen. So, so there's the distinction between faith and reason, because we believe through faith and reason, we can learn certain truths and understand certain mysteries. So our ability to reason helps us to access certain truths by observing that which is seen in the natural world. So the laws of nature, the seasons, our, our biology, reproduction, all of that, just we, we can learn even without faith, we can learn all of that. And, and that we can reason means we are created in God's image and likeness. Faith, on the other hand, gives us to access, gives us access to truths and mysteries that are unseen. Mm -hmm. right? So that's why it's faith, we trust and believe, even though we do not see. Uh, but reason is so key conscience all of that is very much bound up with what it means to be created in god's image our our free will and our intellect that god has blessed us with free will so he will never impose his will on us uh, he will propose and he's counting on us to respond to his grace and cooperate with his grace and finally the capacity to love so all of that is part of the definition of what it means to be created in God's image. Now that's where Mary comes in because early church fathers referred to Our Lady as the new Eve. Why is she the new Eve? Because she's like Eve before the fall. Mm -hmm. So in Mary, there's this mystery where we see the gift of humanity that is authentically free, created in God's image in harmony with God's will, where she obeys him, right? So in Mary, we see obedience, we see trust, we see humility, we see an openness, a surrender, a receptivity to the power of the spirit. So in Mary, we see the beauty of the inner life that is in harmony with God. Uh, and so that's what we celebrate with our Blessed Mother, that and this is why I believe I said it on one of your previous shows when people ask, well, how can I be like Mary? And, and I've said in the past, don't, don't focus so much on whether she was an introvert or an extrovert or a personality type. Um, focus instead on her intimacy with the Holy Spirit and her inner life and how we sense the fruits of the Spirit 
in Mary because she was in harmony with God. Uh, and so that that's possible for all of us. So Mary, her very first title in the New Testament is full of grace. So she's full of God's free gift of supernatural strengthening and power. And the more we do God's will, the more obedient we are, the more we use our freedom to cooperate with his grace, to reason, to self-regulate, to grow in self-knowledge, the more we will grow as well in terms of the interior life, the inner life. And so in Mary is revealed this, this great mystery. And there's the connection between um, what, you know, what I call the internal curriculum of our faith versus the external. So the external curriculum for me would consist of catechesis and doctrine. So memorizing the catechism, taking theology courses, but the internal curriculum is just as important in terms of working on ourselves, character development, becoming virtuous, um, growing in courage, becoming more prudent, being more just, growing in self-control. And Mary is a wonderful example. So when we honor her immaculate heart, again, we're honoring her capacity to suffer, but her capacity to suffer is so great because her capacity to love is so great. So you, you've really taken us on a, a remarkable, um, <laughs> this, this is yeah, probably not the correct words, but a, a remarkable whirlwind tour. You know, <laughs> that's not. I, I I know that that's not the right uh, mm -hmm. the right terminology, and I apologize for it. But so um, you know, we, we we started off talking about what it means um, to celebrate or acknowledge the memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and then how it. Uh, relates to recognizing our Blessed Mother's interior life mm -hmm. and in challenging each and every one of us here to begin to examine our own interior life and in doing so um, to gain sort of more freedom and in understanding what it means to be a child of God. Um, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on this. Uh, I've had this kind of growing conviction, and I don't know if it's right or wrong, but that, you know, many of our society's, you know, problems have involved, uh, you know, both men and women hardening their hearts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so very often, like kind of, we're forced to harden our hearts because we have 3,000 things to do. We have 8,000 responsibilities and and, and like sometimes, yes, you temporarily have to harden your heart to plow through something. Um, but I have this strong conviction that if we keep on hardening our hearts, uh, we can detach ourselves from promptings of the Holy Spirit and detaching ourselves from what God wants us to do. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm happy you brought it up uh, because uh, our Lord used that expression, you know, the the hardening of hearts or, um, and, and it comes up throughout scripture. And, and sometimes my students, you know, ask me, you know, what, what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, when we, when we look at the original meaning, it, it refers to grudge and resentment as well. Oh, yeah. So, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, it, you know, it just, it, and as it women, as <laughs> women I'm like, grudge, resentment, meant, jealousy, gossip, right? Like, women. Sorry. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And that, that sometimes when there's a conflict or a tension, it could be in a marriage, in friendship, in the workplace. And when we do not love the other, Right. So sometimes, you know, if it happens with your kids or your spouse, because you love them and you love them unconditionally, it, it's not going to aggravate you as much and, and you would die for your kids. And so you're just kind of like, OK, you discipline your child. I love you. Let's just move on, get over it. But sometimes with, you know, others and, and sometimes it does happen in intimate relationships as well, where maybe the hurt has been so deep you know, that uh, someone feels so very wounded that they cannot get over a pain, a, a betrayal, a conflict. And when we don't surrender the pain to our Lord in his mercy, 
And when we don't approach it with greater humility and, and praying for the gift of understanding and praying for the Holy Spirit to move our will to forgive, because sometimes some pains are so deep that at a human level, we just, we can't do it. It's, we, we, we're just so upset and we end up kind of playing out the scenario in our heads over and over again. And then the heart gets harder and harder and it almost becomes seductive, just the desire to keep talking about it and how we were wounded and how we were hurt. Um, whereas, you know, our Lord is saying, yes, to, to, to sin, of course, is human, but to forgive is divine because we do need at times divine intervention uh, to help us. But it's when we try to handle conflict in our own way without any coaching around proper conflict resolution or the openness to the process of forgiveness. I think that's usually a big stumbling block for some people when they think of forgiveness, they think it's like a switch. And then they think they're bad Christians because they can't do it right away. But God understands human behavior that that sometimes there's a process involved in the softening of the heart. Um, I like to use when I teach on forgiveness at the seminary an image of a block of wood with two nails. And how sometimes the one person who's been hurt or offended in some way is waiting for the offender to bend. Right. And sometimes this is cultural too. you know, you hurt me, you offended my honor, you've got to come to me. And so sometimes we wait and we wait, but if the offending person lacks self knowledge, humility, self awareness, and are convinced that they're in the right, right, they're not going to bend. And what our Lord is saying in over and over again, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, leave your gift and go reconcile and go quickly that sometimes the one who's been hurt, God is calling you to sacrifice and be heroic and bend. It doesn't mean you're saying, okay, I was, you know, if you believe you were in the right, it, it just means you saying to the other, this relationship matters to me. And although I've experienced great pain as a result of what was said and what happened, I love you and I'm open to having a conversation with the hope that we can reconcile. And sometimes when we approach with great love, it softens the heart of the other and encourages them to bend. And, you know, think of our Lord on the cross, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Sometimes people hurt us, but they do not know what they're doing because they lack humility. Maybe there's ignorance. There's a lack of self-awareness, self-knowledge. And, and if we are not honest with our friends, our family, and our spouses, and we're passive aggressive. So if a spouse says what's wrong and we're like, nothing, I'm good, fine. <laughs> They're not mind readers. <laughs> our husbands are not mind readers. <laughs> and so they may need us to say using I statements, not accusatory you statements, Actually, I am upset. And this is how I experienced the conversation we had the other day, you know, and it gives the other. So, so our Lord knew all too well that too many relationships end, he said, because of the hardness of hearts, uh. that we begin to build that grudge and that resentment. So it's hard like that nail, right? And so we need to be open to the Holy Spirit teaching us something so that we can bend. You know, and our colleagues are not mind readers. Or, you know, so sometimes we, we in our hearts think, well, they just should know what they've done, but they may not know, you know, and then there's different personality types. And Dr. Jordan Peterson is very big. He's got an assessment tool on his website where we can learn more about our temperaments. Mm -hmm. And and so much of that is is due to nature, and you know these are inherited traits. Some are formed by our environment in terms of nurture, but it's so very important that we know a little bit about ourselves. Because here's the issue: when it comes to hardness of hearts, let's say you come from a culture really big on hospitality and generosity and and expressing your love and. Um, and then maybe you're paired up with someone who doesn't, or you have a friend or a colleague who doesn't understand that culture. 
Sometimes we take for granted some of our own cultural norms, but we may also take for granted that we have a very agreeable nature, that we're very conscientious, uh, we're very mindful and considerate of others. And if it comes very naturally to us, it's effortless, we may judge others for not deprecating, oh. right? Mm -hmm. But it, but so for, can I just for a moment talk about personality types? Sure, absolutely. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so so for example, um, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson and others uh, use what is called the Big Five Personality Type Indicator Test. And they use the acronym OCEAN to help people understand themselves. So O stands for openness. So, so people who have an open personality, um, they're open to learning new things, um, new experiences. You know, they're not as rigid, for example, as the other end of the spectrum, where the other end would be someone who likes predictability, likes routine, likes structure, likes to feel prepared. So sometimes you have these two paired up where the open one is, hey, let's go out for dinner tonight. <laughs> and the other is like, no, but I, I, I have this planned at seven o'clock and let's go out on the weekend when I have time to prepare. And so that, that helps with communication in a relationship. Um, the C stands for conscientiousness. You know, so someone who's very conscientious, very attentive. So Our Lady, for example, very well demonstrated in Cana that here she is, she's very conscientious. She, as a guest, notices that the wine has run out. And in the time of Jesus, the groom's family would have supplied the wine. So she knew this is going to be humiliating for the family. So there Mary is demonstrating conscientiousness that she's not only thinking about herself, but she's very mindful of the needs of others. So that's C. Um, e stands for extroversion. And of course, the other end would be introversion. And so even knowing that about ourselves and how as extroverts, extroverts um, have a little bit more stamina, let's say, for social interaction and may need more to feel satisfied. So extroverts suffered during COVID and lockdown because they need that social interaction, uh, not only on Zoom, but to be with people. I, I like to use the example of, of sun and vitamin D. So someone with a dark, darker skin pigmentation, for example, um, may need 20 to 30 minutes of sun, sunlight to absorb the appropriate amount of vitamin D. But someone who's very fair may only need 10 minutes to get the same level of vitamin D. And so if you're paired up with an introvert, um, you know, your spouse, your husband, your kids, your coworkers, they're fine with just, just a little bit of social interaction and they need, and they're fine with solitude, just taking that time to fill their tank on their own. So that's the E. Um, the A stands for agreeableness. Um, you know, I like to use the word easy. You know, I have, you know, really great friends and I believe one's on the show here today. I don't want to embarrass her and name her. Um, but even if like seven months go by and we haven't seen each other, we have lunch and it's like, it's easy, you know, that, that I know I could call her at any time and she'd be there for me and, and I would be there for her. Um, you know, and, and there's no crazy demands for, oh, I haven't seen you in a month. It's just easy. So that's, that's someone who is agreeable. Um, and then finally the end, this, this particular trait can be inherited, but it can also result from trauma, neuroticism. And so what is neuroticism? Uh, someone who is neurotic is someone who is an anxious pessimist. Um, so, so the, the, uh, anxious pessimist is again, you can inherit that. Sometimes we can see it in certain families where one parent is just negative, negative. Um, they kind of give into evil foreboding. What's going to happen next? You're going to get run over by a car if you go out. So <laughs> a lot of fear, right? Like it's a, very, lot of, a lot of moms can. Yeah, yeah. So fear driven, right? Fear, fear, fear. And then this can have an impact on, on the child. So Dr. Jordan Peterson would say with that last trait, that one's both nature and nurture. Whereas for example, uh, we tend to inherit an agreeable nature. 
Yeah. So think about those of you, either whether you have children, maybe you don't have children, maybe you have nieces and nephews, or you come from a big family and you think your parents raised you all the same, but some of you may have a more agreeable nature than others. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so when we think of, I'm going to bring it back to Mary and her inner life. So when we think of Mary and honoring her inner life, what she reveals to us is what we can be and become when we allow the Holy Spirit, the power of God's love to refine us, to transform us, to transform our inner life so that I am going to say to God, okay, I am open. I will respond to your offer, your grace to heal and restore me. Uh, so I, I would look to St. Paul, for example, who I believe describes this process and and he describes it using three stages. And, and Mary, of course, for us represents the end, right? The outcome of going through these stages. Uh, so it doesn't mean she was saved from suffering. Absolutely, she suffered, but she reveals to us God's intended plan for, for humanity. So Paul starts this process with uh, the term he uses, which was a, a a term used in Jewish circles, justification, to be justified. So we hear that in scripture, Paul says, be justified by grace through faith. What does that mean? Justification means righteousness. It means being made right with God. So as Catholics, we believe we are justified through two sacraments, baptism, because on the day of our baptism, we are made right with God when the stain of original sin is washed away. Now, although the stain of original sin is washed away, the effects remain. What do we mean by effects? It means that our human nature has been wounded because of this generational sin, this original sin that goes back to Adam and Eve, their act of rebellion, their disobedience wounded them. And so that means there's going to be a constant struggle within us to use our free will to cooperate with God's will. And so because we struggle from time to time, we're going to fall. Uh, we're going to be arrogant. We're going to gossip. We're going to be rude. Uh, we might hurt people with our anger, but the good news is we have the sacrament of reconciliation. And so each time we confess our sins, we are justified meaning we're made right with God. And the greater the sorrow and sincerity when we confess, the greater the grace we receive. Remember, Mary is full of grace, that at the moment of her conception in her mother's womb, the womb of Saint Anne, Mary was set apart so that God intervened so that her being did not inherit the stain of original sin. And that's why she's the new Eve. So in Mary, we see God's intended plan for humanity before the fall. So in this first stage, on, in working on our inner life and becoming the person God has called us to be, we're kind of back and forth where, you know, we mystics use the word purgation, like, you know, that we're, we're being purged of our bad habits. Um, you know, we're, we're becoming more virtuous. And that requires heroic humility to look in the mirror and, and say this prayer to God, God, help me to see myself the way you see me. Uh, because to my surprise, he's like, Okay. <laughs> and so, so every once in a while in my life, he's like, okay, then I'm going to show you the good. And so sometimes when I'm feeling low, I'll meet someone who has kind of a similar personality. I'm like, Hey, she's kind of bright and perky. And then I'm like, Oh, that that's nice. You know? And then sometimes if I've done something, Oh boy, I call them purgatorial pinches <laughs> that he allows me to see the ripple effect of my bad behavior reflected in another. And, and so God is not in the shaming business. Remember, shame is feeling badly about who we are. Guilt is feeling badly about what we've done. Mm -hmm. And so God is not in the shaming business because my identity is rooted in my baptism. I'm a cherished daughter of the Most High. But he allows us to feel guilt so that 
my conscience is now disturbing me. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. So I'm going to express great regret and sorrow, and then I'm going to be illuminated. He's going to shed light on my behavior. And, and in his mercy, he'll show me, hey, Josie, you were ignorant back then. You didn't know any better. You know, you, you, you need to move on. And so that, that we go through this process, and St. Paul calls this process sanctification. Mm -hmm. So to be sanctified means two things. It means to be set apart. And it doesn't mean we're elitist. It just means, hey, you want to do this work? So now you're in this camp, and I can work with you because you're cooperating with me. Mm -hmm. You're going to allow me to reveal your true self to you so you can be the person I've called you to be. And the second part means to be made holy. And one pastor once said, a lot of people want to be holy without being made whole. So to be holy means to be restored, that the, the, the image and likeness of God is restored within us. So you know someone is open to this process. If you've known them for decades and you've seen them grow in self-knowledge, You've seen them grow in self-mastery or self-regulation. You've seen their ability to reason reach new heights. You've witnessed their capacity to love and to surrender their free will to God. And so Mary is the outcome. So Mary reveals to us what's possible to all of us. A good priest friend what said, Mary reveals the human person fully alive. Mm. Yeah. So, so, Beautiful. so, so again, don't worry. Was she an introvert? Was she an extrovert? Don't worry about that. Focus on her intimacy with the Holy Spirit. In fact, St. Maximilian Kolbe once said in Mary, we see a quasi incarnation of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Yeah. So, so she's not divine, but it means in Mary, we see a person who's experienced intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um in, in someone who is full of the spirit mm -hmm. full of god's grace and how regardless of our past god's mercy is greater than the greatest sin he's just waiting for everyone to surrender that past and that hurt in the sacrament of reconciliation and now, know that the greater the sorrow the greater the grace yeah now can, can you Oh, beautiful. <laughs> if I could have you on every week. <laughs> um, now, can you tell us a little bit about um, how the, the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Memorial of mm. the Immaculate Heart of Mary, like how are they, like, you know, one is on Friday, one is on Saturday. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the two? united hearts like very often you know i see you see the the images sometimes there's even a prayer card where there's you know jesus and his sacred heart and mm -hmm. mary and her heart and i know that the legion of mary does you know remarkable work yeah can you tell us a little bit about the relationship between the sacred heart of jesus and why the solemnity and the memorial were put smack mm -hmm. beside one another can you tell us a little bit about that well i think the the um, the answer to that question lies in the mystery between the shared flesh of our Blessed Mother and her son. Whoa! Because the answer to that question lies in the mystery between the shared flesh between our Blessed Mother and her son, because we need to remember that in Jesus, he's one person, a person of the Trinity in whom two mysteries are revealed, right? So he is one person with two natures. And here's the mystery. He is one person who is 100% divine, 100% human, without uh, confusion, without division, without change, without separation. That's the key teaching of an early council of the church when it came to defining Jesus as one person with two natures. So in Jesus, in his divinity, he reveals the Father. So if we had any questions about who God is, and in fact, in John's gospel, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father, I and the father are one. So he's consubstantial with the father or of the same substance, one in being with the father. However, he's also human. 
And so God could have saved us any other way. He could have sent the Messiah in any other way, but he chose to be born of a woman, our blessed mother. And so Jesus takes his flesh, 100% of his flesh comes from his mother, because remember, he doesn't have a natural father. So St. Joseph is his oh. natural father. Yeah, so yeah. sorry, St. Joseph is his foster father. Right, right, right. Right? Um, God is Jesus' natural father, but God mm -hmm. is spirit. Mm -hmm. And so the spirit needed to assume our humanity in order to be born human. Mm -hmm. And so this is why, like, we could do a whole other session on epigenetics and, and biology and physiology and how sin and trauma wound our physiology. Mm -hmm. um, how addiction, for example, can be handed on from generation to generation or addictive tendencies. So God knowing this, so, so think about Exodus, for example, where um, the author of this particular verse in the book of Exodus says, the sins of the father will be revisited on the third and fourth generations. Um, in my course, the Experts in Humanity Project, I have a whole unit on generational trauma and how trauma in one generation will have an impact on the neurobiology and the physiology of the third and fourth generation, even if they have not experienced trauma. So uh, addiction, if you have addiction in your family, you are there's a 50% chance you will inherit the disposition, like say, for example, to be an alcoholic. So God being God and being omniscient, all knowing, understood that his divinity, his substance could not be one with a flesh that had been wounded. And so Mary is set apart at the moment of her conception, conceived without original sin. So when we celebrate um, the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, we're celebrating that she was conceived, created in the way Eve was before the fall. Mm -hmm. That her humanity, her physiology was not wounded by original sin. So the mystery here is that the flesh of our Lord is the flesh of Our Lady. Oh, and so St. John Paul II in his beautiful reflection on the Eucharist says there's a mystery there because her body is there too. I know that's kind of, I'm sure sounding very radical to some of you who are listening, but he said like, she was very much bound up with her suffering, with his suffering, because it's also her flesh, right? And, and so they have the same heart, mm -hmm. right? And this is why we celebrate it together. Mm -hmm. He has her physical heart because he has her body. So oh. the flesh he assumed was the flesh of his mother. Mm -hmm. So they are very much connected together. And so she, the seeding for her creation, I'm sure happened centuries before because we venerate her parents, St. Anne and St. Joachim. Mm -hmm. So she, she, of course, her flesh, her DNA is from her very holy parents. But then she receives this boost, this download at the moment of her creation mm -hmm. in that the uh, stain of original sin was not allowed mm -hmm. to be a part of her being. Um, and so God, knowing that he needed a creature who had such a capacity to love, who had the capacity to reason, to self-regulate with great self-knowledge, self-awareness, that, that she mirrors God's image perfectly. So think about St. Paul. I love St. Paul. Sometimes people are surprised to hear me say he was a mystic. I believe he was a mystic. Uh, so let's take his first and second letters to Corinthians, for example. In 1 Corinthians, he's writing this letter about around the year 50. In chapter 13, after his beautiful hymn to love, and then he says, love is the greatest gift. He says, now when we look in a mirror, we see dimly or darkly, meaning we, we are in God's image, but, you know, I, until he perfects us, the image is kind of dim. So I, I heard my pastor once preach using this example. He said, consider an artisan who's melting down fine metals. 
and he's melting them down to purify them from toxins or anything that's impure that the artisan he or she knows that the liquefied metal is now pure when they could see the reflection in it mm. perfectly yeah. so mary is the perfect reflection of god in the human person so later when he writes his letter to the corinthians his second letter to the corinthians there's a beautiful verse there where he says ah now we look in the mirror and we see with clarity mm. so 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 that's what the whole gift of Mary and her inner life for us is to see with clarity the image of God fully alive in the human person. So the goal for us in mirroring Mary and becoming another Mary and being her successor is those who are closest to us, they're going to be the ones who are going to track the transformation. So they're going to say, oh, I knew Josie when she was 25 and she was very anxious and afraid and talked way too much. And you know, but, you know, now I know her and she's slowed down a little bit more self-regulation. Only someone who knows me with great intimacy is going to be able to track that. And then we we know we have grown where we're getting closer to that clarity, reflecting God's image when who we are publicly is who we are privately as long as there's a disconnect between who we are publicly and who we are privately we still have a long way to go you know so keep monitoring that that monitor our behavior in a private setting and ask ourselves would i do this if i was leading a retreat with 100 people no probably not yeah. <laughs> so so that's a good way of kind of keeping ourselves in check stay close to our blessed mother Pray for her protection, put her mantle around you and, and just be open. Have the courage to say, yes, I want to mirror God's image perfectly. So and, and I know you will give me your grace, Lord, to do the work. Yeah. Now, um, thank you. Someone said it so beautifully that 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 your reflection is poetic and that's probably better than a whirlwind tour, you know? oh, um, and and thank you for your reflection as being so as we as we enter into the memorial of the immaculate heart of the blessed virgin mary um you know you know me josie i'm kind of like the practical one right mm -hmm. so for the the moms that are watching today what you know we talked about reflecting on her sorrows we talked about um you know honoring her interior life and taking a look at our own interior life we took took a look at what it means to be you know a child of god and made in his image we talked about the importance of you know baptism and reconciliation and so as we enter into this beautiful memorial these beautiful these next two days i um, what could moms do on Saturday, for example, that would be a concrete and visible sign that that they are, in fact, honoring the heart of Mary? Or, or is mm -hmm. there some just practical things that we might be able to do? Any yeah, I would recommend, if you haven't done so already, to start a consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So whether it's uh, St. Louis de Montfort, um, or uh, I have uh, Father Michael Gately's uh, 33 Days to Morning Glory. I would invest in that beautiful booklet. You can order it on Amazon. So it's 33 Days to Morning Glory. And what you can do is you can count back so that you end your consecration on a Marian feast day. So I did it several years ago so that I ended my consecration on the feast of uh, the Our Lady of the Rosary. Yeah, And he has beautiful reflections for each of the 33 days, scriptural reflections, Marian saints like St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Kolbe. And so through this act of consecration, what you're saying to Mary is, I'm yours. <laughs> I'm so, <laughs> yeah, like consecration <laughs> means to make holy, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or to be made holy with. And so you are entering into a holy union with her in in becoming her daughter and 
you know, again, accepting who you are with your personality traits. I've done several personality type indicators. I still come up as an E, <laughs> an extroversion, because sometimes we're like, okay, why am I? So accept who we are with our personality type. But if you're an E, be the best extrovert you can be in magnifying God. If you're an introvert, be the best introvert you can be in magnifying God. And so through an act of consecration, you're making a promise that you are hers and that you're going to allow her through her prayers, through her intercession to help you to become the person God has called you to be. So, so that would be um, something I would consider, uh, I would ask you to consider starting on Saturday. Yeah. So um, again, um, to, you know, one thing that you can do, I know for many years, um, our family did not have a statue of our, our blessed mother. Um, so if, you know, I always say the Holy Spirit calls you is not Dorothy Polarski or Dr. Lombardi, right? But we'd like to provide you with ideas. So um, do something to make this upcoming Saturday special. Um, if you don't usually go to Our Lady's Mass on Saturday mornings, maybe go to Mass on Saturday morning and bring your children. Um, another practical thing that you could do, maybe if you've never had a statue of our Blessed Mother, um, get a statue of our Blessed Mother and people will kind of roll their heads around and ask questions. Another thing that you can do is, as Dr. Lombardi suggested, is to start a consecration to um, our Blessed Mother. If you've never prayed the rosary, I know a lot of women um, that the first time they ever prayed the rosary was at a Catholic mom's group. Um, if you've never prayed the rosary, just say to yourself, okay, to honor Mary. I always say if you really enjoyed Dr. Lombardi's reflection, do something, right? I always say we're, our gatherings aren't just gatherings. Um, we're, we're praying and hoping that the Holy Spirit will call you to do something. And um, as Dr. Lombardi so beautifully stated in a reflection is that whenever you say yes to the Holy Spirit and you do something, um, more graces come, more blessings come. Like, anyway, I, I beg you too to maybe make a list of all of those things that the Holy Spirit has been calling you to do and that for whatever reason you've been ignoring, right? And, and, and very recently, I thought, okay, the Holy Spirit has been really, really um, just almost nagging at me to give copies of this ministry booklet we have to a Nativity of Our Lord Parish. And it's a very long story. And I finally did it this week. And there was just like, phew, internally, right? So um, maybe make a list of a backlog of the things that the Holy Spirit has been calling you to do. Um, we encourage you, you know, ask the Holy Spirit to show you how to celebrate the memorial of the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, you know, maybe say, yes, I'm not going to harden my heart anymore. And um, I just want Dr. Lombardi, I know a lot of you are saying, oh my gosh, this has been so beautiful. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Dr. Lombardi actually has a course, and Dr. Lombardi also has produced a, a remarkable movie. And before she, you know, signs off, before we sign off, I just would like Dr. Lombardi to tell us a little bit about her course and a little bit about her movie and where, you know, where people can get more of you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you, Dorothy. Uh, yeah, so I, I have a website, josephinelombardi.com. And uh, I, the, the film, uh, The First Lady and Her Successors, is available free and on demand on the homepage. And there's also a version with Spanish subtitles. Um, so it's about an hour and 40 minutes. Um, there are interviews throughout the film, but if, I, I'd ask you to stay with it to the end, even if you watch it in chunks, because there's a very moving ending. There's a story that unfolds and it all comes together. Um, also, I started in January a course called the Experts in Humanity Project. Uh, it consisted of 12 online sessions. I had about 70 people uh, sign up 
uh, as the first cohort. And so our first cohort will be ending the course on Monday. Uh, it's been very well received. It's divided into four teaching blocks based on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and so there are three sessions on how to be, three on how to live, three on how to love, and three on how to pray. Uh, so for example, in the first teaching block, uh, we do um, a whole session on self-awareness, self-knowledge, where we look at these personality type indicator tests and growing in greater awareness of ourselves and um, our family of origin issues. Uh, a second uh, session is on factors that influence human behavior, nature and nurture. Another is on generational trauma and understanding the impact of trauma on future generations. Um, and then there are sessions on forgiveness, on addiction, mental health, conflict management, the art of good conversation. Um, we, we did a, a whole session on um, Ignatian discernment and how to discern when there's a decision that needs to be made with prayer and scripture. Uh, virtuous leadership, focusing on the cardinal virtues. And the final session Monday night is a retreat night on the Our Father. So I, I'm planning on offering a second cohort. Um, uh, so if you are interested, just shoot me an email, let me know, and I'll put you on the list. I'm just praying over whether it will be in person or online again. So um, just let me know. I'm waiting to hear about my duties at the seminary for next year. As soon as I have those duties, I, I can pick um, uh, pick the dates for the course uh, for the next time it's offered. So thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, for giving me the opportunity to plug the course. Oh, and, uh, gosh, no, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to taking the course. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we find out more about it, we'll definitely let you know more about it. Um, I always feel kind of a little bit guilty because things don't go as perfectly as I wanted them to. And I just realized now I, I forgot to begin our session with prayer. <laughs> I prayed with Dr. Lombardi before we came on, but we didn't pray together. Um, so I'm just going to suggest we uh, just say a short closing prayer and ask our Blessed Mother to cover it backwards and forwards and everything. Uh, so dear Lord, we know that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, that you are present. Uh, we acknowledge your presence. We rejoice in your presence. We thank you for the gift of uh, Dr. Josephine Lombardi. We thank you for all of the moms that have signed on today. Uh, we ask our Blessed Mother to wrap her loving arms around each of us, and we beg for an anointing of the Holy Spirit to surrender and follow um, God's will. And so we turn to our Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, if any of you feel called to start a Catholic Moms group, don't forget visit catholicmomsgroup.com. Um, the, 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 one of the most rewarding things in um, just working with this ministry is just seeing how moms that come into it and come into the moms group, they get pulled into different ministries later, right? Because the mother's group is sort of like the introduction um, and nothing brings me greater joy than to see one of our moms become the president of the Legion of Mary or one of our moms, um, you know, joining one of the movements in the church or one of the moms uh, taking Dr. Lombardi's course. And I want you sitting there watching today to invite moms that you know maybe that aren't going to church to join us on midday moms you know maybe to visit our uh you know youtube channel maybe to visit dr lombardi's page because our blessed mother needs you to reach out to 10 women and if you reach out to 10 women you know that's how the faith is going to grow it's not going to grow by just holy people sticking together and praying right we need to make friends with uh, women in our circle and say hey do you know about dr josephine lombardi hey do you know about catholic moms group hey you know um so in conversation i just beg each and every one of you to reach out to the moms that you know maybe pass them one of dr lombardi's books you know like 
<laughs> we're the ones that are going to make a difference. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, you know that I, I, I love you all to pieces. We offer a weekly mass for each of the moms that are connected to our ministry. Right now, we're begging moms to complete a survey so that we can make plans for the future. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lombardi. Um, Thanks for having me. We love you to pieces. And, oh, I love uh, you guys too. Thank you. Yeah, so we've got a lot of accolades and a lot of thank yous. And Michelle, I'm hoping that you're still going to start a Catholic moms group because Michelle, Michelle's like, keep your course online because then I can come because I think Michelle's from Ohio. Hi, oh, Roseanne. Okay. Yeah, hi, Roseanne. Uh, hi, Flavia. So Donna, hello. So thank you, Catherine, for attending. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Diana. So thank you, all of you. Um, I'll be bringing all of your intentions to Mass. I'm going to a special Mass at the Ave Maria Center of Peace on Saturday. I'm looking forward to it. And um, as they say, mwah, mwah, mwah. bye now. Thank you. Have bye a great bye. day, everybody. Thank Take you. Care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, look at all these.